think that one of the skills that a chief learning officer and really any head of people right now is curator. I, I do think that part of our job, you know, years ago when I first started in this career, we had to come up with a lot of content and pull together different frameworks and models of working. And now that's so, that's it. We have so much of that available online. It's more contextual now. So I think it's being able to curate the right kind of content at the right time with the right people in the right context. One of my main jobs is to make sure that whatever we're encouraging people to learn and whatever skills we want people to build, that it's relevant and, and within the context of what our business is trying to build. So today, I have a guest that is instrumental in helping you elevate your business, helping you grow professionally and personally, and so that you and help you learn to take your business and your career to the next level. So before I go any further, let me introduce you to the chief learning officer at Udemy, Melissa Daimler. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. It's great to be here. Terrific. So, Melissa, I I had just said to you for the brief time we were talking before we came online here is I personally think, no, I don't have the inside scoop, but just from the outside looking in, I think you have one of the most interesting jobs on the planet because for me, anybody that is involved with helping people learn and grow, learn skill sets, stretch outside their comfort zone, I just think is of incredible value and service to anybody who wants to thrive in today's world. And quite frankly, if you're not learning, I think you're dying. That might mm -hmm. sound a little harsh, but I really feel strongly about that. So my question to you is, Tell us something about yourself. Oh, she's giving, for the people that are listening, she's giving me this funny look. <laughs> Tell me something about yourself, Melissa, that has influenced who you are today that most people don't know about. They can't read it in, on Google. They won't find it in your book. Something that very much shaped who you are and the woman and the professional you've been, become but most people don't know about it. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great. Oh, to you're welcome. Here. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I tell a lot of stories in the book, but probably a story that a lot of people don't know is I'm half Swedish and I first started going to Sweden when I was seven years old and uh, went with my father uh, to visit my and meet my grandfather for the very first time. Okay. So excuse me. So your dad was Swedish, I take it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for the people that are listening, I can tell you, I absolutely see the Swedish. Like when she said <laughs> Swedish, I wasn't sitting there like shocked. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I'm from the Midwest. I grew up in Wisconsin and I think- Oh, really? Where? Two of Madison. my kids went to Wisconsin. Madison. Yeah. It's a oh, great city. Great yeah. city. Great yeah. city. Did it's you go to school city. there? I did not because okay. all of my friends went there. So I wanted to God forbid. break and out the would have been too and go to Minnesota. Yeah. So okay. I didn't go too far away, but it is a great school. It's a great place to grow up and uh, good people. And I think. Oh, very nice people. Very what nice. What happened when I went to Sweden is that I was so curious and overwhelmed with the different ways of living on the other side of the world. I had a lot of questions and now you're seven. You said I was seven. Yeah. I'm and just so curious. Why did you not go before seven? Um, I don't know if we could afford it. I think this was kind okay. of uh, the, the age limit that my dad wanted to, I actually went, I was the youngest of 
the three children, I have an older brother and older sister okay. went, um, my grandpa visited us, but this was the first time. I don't okay. think I would have appreciated it younger. Okay. My dad, of course, went, but, uh, this was an age where I think I could truly appreciate and connect with my grandpa and relatives over there. So I just, I think there were a lot of opportunities for me just to learn about a different culture and a different set of customs. And, you know, I think it was the first time I had ever gone in a plane for 12 hours. And, uh, oh, wow. was it that long a flight from the Midwest? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I had a lot of questions just about the, how our luggage got there mm -hmm. and, uh, the, you know, my, my grandpa served, uh, raw herring, which is a, a dish over there. Like I, I didn't love that, but I wanted to experiment. Smells too, right? What everybody was eating. Um, my, some of my relatives wore the traditional costume. So I had a lot of questions around that. Um, they obviously so describe, describe what the costume is. The, the, are we allowed to use the word costume? It's the native garb or yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, just, a a my aunt wore it. It's a, a red and yellow dress with a little kind of white apron and a white hat. And, oh, okay. um, it's beautiful and everything. It's, it's, it's wool. Is it wool made of wool? I think so. They hand yes. make everything. Mm -hmm. And I also just appreciated the language. Like I obviously didn't know Swedish. My dad had learned when he was- By the way, excuse me, Melissa, the, the irony's not lost on me. I'm saying this for the listeners, that you're wearing a sweater that's red and yellow. Oh, I didn't do that on purpose. No, I know, but it's yeah. just amazing how that works. Yeah. yeah, I So I just appreciated the way that, my world had opened up that I had learned a lot about my family, but the opportunity to experience it and uh, really ask a ton of questions. I was a very curious child. And I think that's one of the reasons, many reasons I went into learning and organizational development because I not only like learning, but I was very much interested in all of the different pieces of the system. And I think that's been one of the themes of my career is systems thinking. I have a story. Hey, hang on one second. Tell me, tell oh. me what you mean by that as it relates to being a seven-year-old in a different country. Uh, I think that I obviously did not say at seven years old, I'm a systems <laughs> thinker, but I think- <laughs> I was always trying to piece together what everything meant. You know, why, why do we, why do we eat what we're eating and why are they um, speaking in a, in a different language? And then mostly when I met a lot of different family members, I was trying to piece together how we were all connected and what, uh, what was the, you know, link to my great, aunt and my grandfather and how is my dad linked with his cousins and um i just it, it was fascinating to me that here i was growing up in the midwest in the united states that there was this whole other kind of system of human beings and activities and and traditions that i was connected to that i didn't know before and now, so, hang on a second, because yeah. you're younger than me, but it, it's sounding and feeling like this was right before like the internet took off where you would have been FaceTiming with your family over there. I did not, no. Yeah, Just, yeah, no. interesting. I am, I am that old that we were not FaceTiming with my family. Yeah. No, 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 you're not I, old at all, but yeah. younger people are listening saying, well, why didn't she just Google Oh yeah, we them? did not do FaceTime. No, yeah, yeah. I had, we, this was in the days where I, my grandfather wrote letters to me before we met. So, and we continued obviously after even more so because we then had a, had a face-to-face -face connection. So yeah, I did not have any experience with my family in Sweden until we met in person. And so, you know, I think just to sum up here, I, I, I think the, uh, the story as it relates to me is that I, again, I've always been a curious learner and wanting to learn about 
different things around the world. And I think that trip and the connection to my family was the impetus to that. And then really understanding and craving the connection of how things work together. And I think if you take that back to my career, I've always been a systems thinker who's been really looking at how do all these parts work together? How does the organizational structure impact, you know, the team working well together? How does the, in my book, I talk a lot about the why, what, and how, you know, how does the mission, the why relate to strategy, the what that relates to the how, which is the culture. And so Mm -hmm. if those aren't all connected, the overall system isn't working as effectively together as if you're just looking at one of the parts working. So that's a story that has a lot of meaning for me. I was very close to my father. He has since passed away and was very close to my grandpa. And we were pen pals up until his uh, death. Um, So I, and I still have cousins over in Sweden that I keep in touch with and that I'm very close to. So it's, so it sounds like you're looking for patterns and the overlying or the underlying common denominator. Mm-hmm. which certainly I hear it in the way you just said, the why, the hat, the how and the what. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am curious, how did your parents meet? Was it a war story? Your mother, I take it, was American. Um, well, no, my father came over like um, at a very, I mean, he came over at a, uh, I can't remember. I think it was, he was younger. I mean, he he was, I think, 10 Um, and so he grew up, I mean, he grew up in the U S but then my grandparents went back to Sweden after he went to school. Um, so he spoke, he was born in Sweden and English both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So your parents met in the States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is he the only one in his family here? Uh, yes. I mean, we, I mean, my dad passed away. I mean, all we have, we still have relatives over in Sweden, but yeah, there's nobody here in the U S anymore. Okay. So, so help me understand, help the, to talk a little bit about, this might be, I think I'm going to be fascinated by this about, so Sweden, there are they socialist country. Is that right? Socialism. It's not capitalism, right? Um, Yes, I would say they're more on the the socialist social side. side. Yeah. Right. No, no judgment. Just mm-hmm. definitely different. Yeah. Europeans have a very different attitude towards work, mm-hmm. work life balance, all that stuff. Right. Um, I, I would suggest we're probably two opposite ends of the spectrum. You mm-hmm. know, like Americans, like we'll, we'll work till our death, and the Europeans are like not so much. Um, but how how do you how did your Swedish influence? from your time there, learning the culture, having family there. How did that influence your work as a professional here in the States? I mean, I would say it's more influenced through my father and, you know, also, of course, through my mom. But I I did appreciate the ways of living in Sweden. And I do think they are doing it better than we are in the U S in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. I, I think they value family a lot more. They've set up their system to make it a lot easier to have children and to have, do they have the year maternity leave? Is it Sweden or Denmark? I'm sorry, what? Is it Sweden or Denmark that has the year maternity leave for women when you have a baby? They both do. They both yeah, isn't do. that awesome? I mean, Lord, that would have made my life a lot yeah. easier. So I just think they have that down. And I just, I think a lot of the values that um, Sweden has just around family were were definitely um, passed on through my dad and just his, uh, I would also say just his way of quietly leading and, mm-hmm. you know, ever influencing in a way that wasn't, uh, so explicit and in your face, but just, you know, when he talked, we all listened because he didn't talk all the time and he didn't feel a need to contribute to every conversation. But when he did, 
it was impactful. And so I just learned a lot about leadership and, uh, you know, how to influence without necessarily having to be front and center, Mm -hmm. uh, but really thoughtfully uh, contribute to a conversation or a situation in a way that was, that was going to have a positive impact. Yeah. I mean, I, you, you were reminding me again, we'll date ourselves, the old EF Hutton, when EF Hutton talks, people listen, mm-hmm. right? And there is, to your point, and I, I can't imagine anybody arguing this, but it could be, there's so much noise today. There's so much noise out there. So how do you cut through the noise and and, and be able to, as a chief learning officer, mm-hmm. extricate the maybe the pearl and the oyster or just the pearl itself? I think that one of the skills that a chief learning officer and really any head of people right now, and I've said this for a while, is curator. I I do think that part of our job, you know, years ago when I first started in this career, we had to come up with a lot of content and pull together uh, different frameworks and, uh, models of working. And now that's so that's, we have so much of that available online. Mm -hmm. It's more contextual now. So I think it's being able to curate the right kind of content at the right time with the right people in the right context. And so my job, one of my main jobs is to make sure that whatever we're encouraging people to learn and whatever skills we want people to build that it's relevant and and within the context of what our business is trying to build. And so an example is, you know, we're we're in the middle of 2024 planning right now and we're still going through a lot of change as a company. We've been shifting a lot in the last couple of years since I've been here from a focus on the consumer, direct to consumer to businesses. We have about 15,000 customers that we're working with. Meaning business customers. Yeah. And and so, you know, a lot of them are trying to figure out what is the learning strategy that'll work for me and my company? What is it that I'm trying to, you know, to build? And uh, one of the things that we say is, you know, really be clear on the skills that you want every employee to learn, regardless Mm -hmm. of function or level or geography. And so uh, we're looking at three skills that we're going to focus on next year. And they're around decision-making, change leadership, and coaching. And so we're building out learning experiences for every employee globally to really enable them to build and uh, learn about how to make better decisions. How do I coach? How do I actively listen? How do I ask good questions? How do I uh, really help my team move through change effectively? Mm-hmm. So there's a ton of other skills that we can you know, encourage employees to build, but those are the primary focus areas for next year. So a lot of CLOs and companies are, are really trying to do that more. Like, how do I curate? How do I get super clear about the skills needed based on what we're trying to accomplish as a business next year? Okay, so uh, I'm struck by what you said because that's so in my wheelhouse. I mean, uh, my tagline is, all success is based upon your ability to create, nurture, and sustain healthy relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, it's trust, emotional intelligence, and effective communication. And everything you just said, active listening, change leadership to me is, I understand what you're saying, but it's almost redundant, right? Because the only constant, my gosh, is change. Um, What made you as a company pick those three specific areas? We are going through quite a bit of change next year. We have quite a few leaders at the top that, you know, we're still kind of integrated into the organization. We're we're shifting, you know, a lot of our um, ways of working with AI now. So we have an AI bot that we're putting into our product. We're we're thinking about how to use AI uh, in our everyday work to become more effective. 
uh, we're looking at, you know, kind of shifting our practices as a team, you know, the whole kind of what got you here is not going to get you there is something that we're working with a lot of leaders around. Um, so I think, our, you know, our whole business model is changing. So, and we have to be more agile in in this world to be able to navigate what's happening. So I think change was pretty easy. Coaching is a skill that I feel everybody should have, whether you're a people manager or an individual contributor. Um, I, I think we're realizing that that, you know, in order for us to move through change effectively, that is something that uh, every employee needs to hone and practice. And then we've gotten a lot of feedback from our engagement surveys and a number of different ways that we get feedback from employees that we're not as clear around decisions and who makes decisions and how those decisions get made and how to help people uh, clarify once a decision ma- is made, who's part of that project or initiative. And so that's why we chose decision making. Mm-hmm. Um, speak to how much uh, the ability to get buy-in impacts what you just described, and how you communi- how you teach that. How you teach buy-in? Well, you have to get for, for anything that you just described to have to to work truly work. You have to have the buy-in from the top down. I think yes. I think that the otherwise it's command and control. Yeah, I mean, I I think a lot of this is just being super clear about the why and context on, you know, you know, you're talking about bringing people along, and so I think if you get clear on this is where we're going, which we've outlined, you know, this is these are our six objectives, this is why we're focusing on these six objectives. Then, as a team, you're focused on those here's what we expect from all of you as employees and leaders. And then here's what you can expect from us and helping you uh, achieve those outcomes. And so I think the buy-in is, you know, where that comes in is just being super clear about the why and the role that everybody plays and how we're all going to work together to do that versus to your point, uh, just declaring this is what we're doing. This is what you're supposed to be doing and you're going to do it or else. I mean, nobody right. wants to work in a place like that. Right. Uh, but they still really exist. A lot of them. A lot. Of Unfortunately, them. yes. So so how do you, um, you know, you, you, you're trying to, in terms of content creation, right? I mean, I don't envy you. You're trying to play checkers. You're trying to play chess, right? So that you can be steps ahead so that when a company has their people go on to Udemy, that the content they need at the moment is available. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide who creates that content? Like what area of expertise does your content creator have to have? Well, our business model is such that our creators are not employees of Udemy. Mm-hmm. They are independent um, contractors who uh, can put content on our platform. And there's a, a set of guidelines that we obviously have. But because of that flywheel, we are able to, we're not a publishing house. So they're able, like for AI, we were one of the first uh, platforms to have the most relevant and recent uh, courses on AI because we had instructors who were well ahead of the curve and (laughs) what was coming. And so they could uh, put courses on our platform that everybody immediately wanted to to leverage Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. everybody knew that this big wave of AI was coming. Mm -hmm. So we, for our Udemy business model, we definitely curate the the content and do a little bit of QA to make sure that it's the right content for businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, again, we're not, we don't go through every single course and make sure that every piece of content is consistent with how we would do it. We want people to, we want instructors. Oh my to gosh, that would drive you crazy. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I would say that again, we have guidelines, and they, they, we, we actually have a model where uh, the people who take our courses get to give feedback. You know, so mm -hmm. we monitor that. Oh, I've taken plenty of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you give a, you know, four point or under, we that's a red flag for us. And so mm -hmm. we we take a look and say, hey, you know, we we definitely pull courses off of our platform if that's consistent uh, feedback that that we get. So we monitor that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a what I love about the model is that we do give an opportunity for for people who have uh different like a different set of of um skills and expertise that that we don't have internally i think i think that's great how how do I, this is a silly question my question was going to be who is your ideal client is it the individual entrepreneur solopreneur is it you know the chief people officer that signs up for you know my my I, I, I coach and consult both for entrepreneurs and corporate, right? And I know one of the companies I have, they um, they use Udemy. Their their people are allowed to get some kind of specific content. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm just curious, what does what does what do you prefer for your client? And is it based upon what's more profitable? I would imagine. It's more profitable if you have a 3,000 employee company signs up and the people use your services versus the one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I'm amazed at what great content is on that site mm -hmm. pretty much for free and, and a, yeah. a lot of times. It's just, uh, uh, it's, it blows me away. Yeah. I mean, I, we we definitely still want, you know, individuals to, to go on the platform. We have kind of individual plans, you know, what we call personal plan, but we also have team plans. So if you happen to just be on it in a company and then you decide that you want your team to be on it, you can go into that. And then that sometimes evolves into an enterprise plan. So um, I, I, I think ideally we work with companies to map whatever skills they're trying to build to our courses. And so I know for me as a learner, if my colleagues are also learning something similar to me and have access to information that we can then discuss and talk through, that's a much more robust learning experience mm -hmm. than if I'm just watching a video by myself. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we're encouraging a lot more active learning. We have assessments. So Technical learning is a, is a big component on our platform, but also, as you said, we have a whole uh, suite of business and leadership uh, courses that people leverage. So it's the usually the CTO or the CLO that, that we're talking to, mm -hmm. to, to really figure out how do we uh, provide courses to augment, you know, whatever kind of learning strategy you're trying to build out. And then how do we continue to build ways for your learners to be more active through assessments, through labs, through feedback from instructors? We're also testing this next year. Um, how do we how do we know if somebody has achieved a business skill? You know, we have a lot of work on the technical side of the house through badging and certification. And assessments, but it's harder, as you know, to to identify if somebody's proficient in communication or emotional intelligence. So we're looking at um, building a number of tools that will help us identify people in demonstrating their emotional intelligence and then being able to then get certified or badged on, you know, I'm I'm verified or um I, I can validate that I uh, understand and have the skill set of somebody who is emotionally intelligent. I mean, I think that's great. And that's that's a hard thing to do. Hard thing you know, to do. I think it's Tony Robbins that says, you know, there's 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 a huge difference between knowing cognitively and knowing from an emotional perspective, right? And I know in my work, I work with really smart people and they can they can espouse from now until tomorrow concepts mm -hmm. but being able to operationalize it, it quite frankly to me is the coaching and consulting work that I do 
mm-hmm. right? Like, sure. so he, you know, like maybe something even easier than, than emotional intelligence. They had to have a difficult conversation. You can role play that, mm-hmm. right? Um, but people still don't know how to have a difficult conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like if it's a sit down and it's a ridiculously outdated yearly performance review, total prejudice on my part. I think they're ridiculous. Um, you can have the difficult conversation, but I believe those kind of reviews should be ongoing. I think people should be aware of how their work is going as their work is going. And sometimes that's in the moment and that's harder to then articulate the difficult conversation in a way where it comes across as helpful feed forward, as Marshall Goldsmith would say, as opposed mm-hmm. to negative feedback, right. you know, and, and, and I see that constantly as a challenge. How do you address that in what you're describing now? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, we're, we don't, we're nowhere near having an assessment ready, but I think, you know, in previous companies where I have worked, the, the classic way to, to do that is 360s are so good because you are getting feedback and a viewpoint, not just through self-attestation, but through your peers and through your manager. And Mm. so I think there's some really good uh, 360s out there. Mm. Oh, you of course can uh, customize it based on the skills and behaviors that you want to reinforce in your company. And so I've done that at both Adobe and, and Twitter where I was before. And uh, I, I think those are the best ways right May now. May I challenge you, Melissa? Sure. Okay. And I do want to talk about Adobe and Twitter. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, I find 360s are an absolutely bureaucratic monstrosity of an expensive tool that keeps HR churning. I, I just find them absolutely, just my own opinion. Doesn't mean there's not valuable information in there, but it's quite time consuming and, and lengthy. What I like is when you're coaching someone or working with them and you say, you know, go to, you can go to six people, two lateral, two above, two below and say, I'm being coached or I'm trying to work, get better. What do you suggest? What would, what do I need help with? How can I improve? You listen, they come back to you, you work on it. You, the coach person being coached, the employee goes back to those people. So in essence, not exactly, but you're getting real-time feedback as you go along with people as you're working with them or as your supervisor is hearing about how your work is going. I think that's, I mean, of course, that's great as well. I don't know if everybody always feels like they're in a safe, psychologically safe place to to get that feedback. I Fair think enough. We, yeah, can be biased, and I also think that three sixties are a way to get three sixties can be biased too. <laughs> of course, but I think you can get quantitative data there based on mm. skills that you're trying to um, develop in the organization. Mm. There's things that individuals want to develop, but there's also if you're especially if you're in an organization, there is a uh, a contract, if you will, that if you're in the organization, there are some skills that we want you to. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the 360s that I've done, you can customize based on the skills that we Mm -hmm. want to make sure everybody is Mm -hmm. uh, building. But yeah, I mean, there's bias in so many different assessments for sure. Yeah. I mean, and you always have to, right? It's like when, when am I allowed to say this? When you go on Amazon or you go on a book review, right? There's always going to be that one off the chart and one horrible, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you throw the outliers out and then you, you have something in the middle. So in, in your role as the chief learning officer at Udemy, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, are, you are cutting edge on what people want, what people need for success. So you talked earlier about your experience with going into Sweden and that different Mm -hmm. culture versus the States, right? Like one is like chillish and the States is like, you know, more is more. And I'm a native New Yorker, like more is more is more is more. It's crazy in a lot of ways, right? Um, 
And you're in California, so I don't know. I don't feel like San Francisco is as chill as it used to be either, but I could be wrong. Um, how did this influence your book that you just published? So I want you to talk about that, Reculture. So I, the impetus of this book was 20 plus years of being on the front lines of leadership and understanding what it looks like to have healthy and effective cultures and ones that aren't. So I had the opportunity to work in some pretty great cultures, uh, Adobe and Twitter in particular. Twitter, as we knew it before, is no longer around. Uh, and, well, it's not even called that anymore, too. Right. right. And so I had then I had the opportunity, which I can call it now, to work at WeWork and understand that when you don't take culture and people seriously, uh, that impacts the business as well. Sure. And so I had read so many research articles and papers and books, frankly, on culture by people who had never stepped into an organization. And so I really wanted to share my experiences, both the ones that were successful and ones that I could learn from through failure mm -hmm. and how to do culture in a way that was practical, because I still think we talk about culture in a very theoretical yeah. Um, way and it does a disservice to people leaders. It's not about the ping pong games. Mm -hmm. It's not about the happy hours. It's not about the free food. It is a very uh, big opportunity to. It's a, it's a leverage point that I don't think we always um, leverage. And I think culture. Why I called it reculturing is that it's a verb, not a noun. Um, mm -hmm. It is something that we're always practicing if you do it right. And so, what is the biggest? What are what are the three main things and you, the, what you talk about in your book, Reculturing, that companies need to do right that perhaps they don't? I think the three main things are that you can't just stop defining your culture at values. You have to go further and talk about the behaviors. And if I would write it today, I would also talk about skills. So, you know, hmm. you can't just say innovation you know, is important to us, you have to talk about what would that look like if we were innovative at Udemy. And so when we talk about always learning, for us, one of our behaviors is we engage in constructive debate, because we know that when we debate each other, we're learning. Um, I think the- That would be great if the rest of the uh, country engaged in yeah, I know. constructive debate, right? Yeah. For sure. And then the second one is all about processes. So how do we embed those behaviors into hiring process, onboarding process, development process, uh, compensation process, rewards process, recognition. So I think we really need to embed, uh, you know, kind of behaviors into those processes because you're that would give the opportunity to exemplify culture in a way that you can't if it's just values on a wall. Mm -hmm. And the practices are, how do you communicate? How do you meet? How do you connect? How do you, how do you work day to day with your team and with your colleagues? And how do you take the opportunity to do things like in my team meetings, we always try to have constructive debate as an example. So how do you express mm -hmm. culture um, in the ways that, you know, we said are really important behaviorally? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I have a dear friend and what he'll say is, this is what we believe, or this is what I do as the evidence by, mm -hmm. right? So as it's exactly what you're saying. Okay. So Melissa, I want you to unabashedly promote your book, mm -hmm. tell people where you'd like them to go to get it and where they can learn and find out more about you. Thank you. So uh, I have a website, melissadaimler.com. You can read more about the book and about me there. Uh, you can go and on- Daimler Amazon. is D-A-I-M-L-E-R. -E L-E-R. Okay, make sure they yeah. get that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can go on Amazon. So uh, very easy. It's on, uh, on there. You can also, it's in a lot of your local bookstores, hopefully, as well. If you do go on Amazon, would love for you, if you like it, to write a review, because as you said before, every review counts. So um, that's where you can find me. Great. And I know people will absolutely love it. I think 
This is, I have so many more questions, but I want to respect your time. I, I think this topic of culture and your book, Reculturing, is so timely. Honestly, I don't think it ever goes out of fashion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't care what your business or your product is or how smart you are. If you cannot have a positive culture in your business, in your family, in your community, in your country, you're not going to lead and you're not going to succeed. You might you might have little battle wins, but you will lose the war. So I think this topic is so timely. So Melissa, thank you so much for thank being you. such a great guest. I, I urge everybody, do not walk, run to your computer or your bookstore and order this book.